and we can make lower nature's accelerators by comparing um, the predicted um, and observed gamma ray properties. Then in the first chapter, we quickly review the gamma ray observations. In section one, I will review the high energy gamma rays in GEV energies. Then in section two, I will quickly review the very high energy gamma rays in TEP energies, tera electron volts and giga electron volts. The Large Area Telescope, we call it LAT. Now, LAT is the principal inst instrument um, about the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. And the Fermi satellite was launched on um, June 11, 2008. So it has been already 10 years after the launch. And the Gamma Ray Astronomy has achieved a big progress by the success of the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. The Large Area Telescope is an imaging high energy gamma ray telescope. And the lab detect um, photons between 20 MeV and 300 GeV. And in this figure, the left, left hand side corresponds to low frequency photons, radio, then microwave, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X ray, and gamma rays are the shortest wavelengths and highest energy photons. And 20 MeV to 300 GeV corresponds this energy range in the rightmost part of this um, wavelength figure. And such gamma rays can be emitted only by ultra relativistic particles, particularly electrons and positrons. The field view of LAT is approximately 2.5 steradian, and um, the LAT covers the entire sky every three hours. In the angular resolution of the LAT instrument, um, is approximately a few degrees, um, say three degrees at uh, 100 MeV, and 0 0.04 degrees at 100 GeV. That is at higher with uh, higher energies, um, angular resolution will become better. I will skip the details of the instruments. In instruments, please ask Shankar for details. <laughs> I'm not an expert for the and I'm a theorist, so I cannot explain very well about the techniques. <laughs> and let us look at the gamma ray sky about 10 GeV, that is in high energy gamma ray energy, high energy gamma rays. And pulsars are the most numerous objects in the high energy sky. And the pulsars distribute, well, particular young pulsars distribute along the galactic plane. This is a galactic plane, and galactic center is located here. And pulsars are mostly found along the galactic plane. And however, Koichi, I cannot see this Fermi bubble in this. Ah, yes, yes, yes. It's not easy to take, but. The new kind of pulsars are found at higher galactic latitudes. Also at high galactic latitudes, active galactic nuclei are most numerous. So far, Fermi has detected um, more than 200 rotation powered pulsars and more than 60 active galactic nuclei. Also, Fermi has detected, uh, LAT has detected 12 supernova remnants and 9 pulsar wing debris and other sources. In a pie chart, 
um, the fraction of the identified sources can be depicted like this. The majority is a person, and also at high galactic latitude, many, many more than 60 active galactic nuclei are found. Among the pulsars, young radio selected pulsars are 55 and 55, and compare the number of young um, lamp selected, gamma selected pulsars are also found. And the most numerous population of rotation powered pulsars found by Helmut is the Mexican pulsars, which are radio selected and mostly found in, in globular clusters. So the total number exceeds already 200. And for active galactic nuclei, bladers are the, well, largest, is the largest population. And the radio galaxies whose jet, relativistic jet, pointing toward us are called blazer and BLX. And BLX are 18 million lakhs have been found so far, uh, and more intrinsically luminous ones, strong jets are pointing to us, and such sources are called flat spectrum radio craters, and 38 of them have identified with fair light. Well, for more details, um, accretion rate is considered to be sub-editor for the radio galaxies. And for these very luminous craters, accretion rate is supposed to be super-editor. So the accretion disk status is enough for such radio galaxies, while the accretion disk is supposed to be a thin disk, a kind of relatively inefficient accretion flow. But anyway, later jets are pointing to us. <coughs> and uh, Fermi Lat, the highlights of Fermi Lat findings uh, can be well raised in such a way. For example, uh, Gabriel Burroughs are found, and there uh, are you know, short Gabriel Burroughs are considered to be. And compact mergers, neutron star, neutron star, and neutron star black holes. Well, if black hole, two black holes coalesce, coalesce, if two black holes merge, it is very difficult, most, most difficult, to emit electromagnetic waves unless they are charged and rapidly rotating. So, um, and the, the gamma ray bursts are mostly. Neutron star, neutron star collision, uh, uh, merger, or neutron black hole merger. And another type of long duration burst uh, due to the collapses, that is rapidly spinning stellar collapses with jets. Uh, another finding is um, the active galactic nuclei, and later another. Active galaxies. Also, as Ken mentioned, Fermi Barrel has been found uh, well, uh, near the galactic central region. <coughs> and the pulsars have, have also been found. Um, and rotation powered young pulsars and rotation powered mystical pulsars um, are found. And they are numerous. And some um, traditional transitional mystical pulsars switching between accreting and non-accreting non states are also found. Then uh, let us quickly review uh, the observations in very high energy gamma ray uh, very high energy gamma rays in TeV energy ranges. We use 
imaging atmospheric Cherenkov telescope like this figure. This is a picture of um, this one is his. This one, this one, this one is his. And, and they have um, 28 meter big optical reflector together with four 12 meter telescopes. Okay, fine. And the HES telescope has been operational since the summer of 2002. And it is located in the southern hemisphere, Nambia. So HES can observe the galactic plane, including the galactic central regions. And this telescope is sensitive between 100 GeV and 10 TeV. Another example of IACT, Imaging Atmospheric Check of Telescopes, is the MAGIC telescope. It has currently two 17-meter telescopes and became operational since 2008, um, 2004. Sorry. And it is located in Canary Islands in um, Spain, in, in the Northern Hemisphere. And it is sensitive between 30 GeV to 100 TeV. The threshold energy decreases from um, 100 GeV to 30 GeV because they have two big, really, uh, two big telescopes, 17 meters in radius. Oh, no, diameter, sorry. And another ISCT is the Veritas. And it is located in Arizona, United States, and became operational from 2007. Mm. The Veritas telescope is sensitive between 50 GeV to 50 TeV. And between 10 GeV and 100 TeV, between 10 GeV and 100, 100 TeV, the blue curve shows the current, currently working ISCTs, imaging atmospheric Cherenkov telescopes, and the new future project currently being constructed is the CTA Cherenkov Telescope Array it will improve the sensitivity more than several times in each energy band. So Hess and Veritas are the same? Hmm, well, they describe so. <laughs> They're close, close to the yes, same. Yes, close, anyway. And Magic, Magic has two big you know, telescopes, so it is sensitive at low energies. A uh, near future project, Cherenkov Telescope Array, has more than 100 telescope, telescopes and will be operational in the near future. And it is located in two sides, both in northern and southern hemispheres, and it will be sensitive about 20 GeV. So the threshold energy further goes down from magic. In the TeV sky, Pulsar wind nebula or supernova remnants are found along the Milky Way. Here, along the Milky Way. This is the TV um, sources found by um, Hess Magic and Veritas. And AGMs are found away from the galactic plane, like the uh, red ones. They, they are all AGMs. And also, un unidentified sources are also found along the Milky Way. The green circle 
chose the unidentified sources. So it's a bit of a career. But unidentified key resources are also part of the database. Test magic enumerators have detected so far more than 200 key resources, and 157 of them have been identified with other frequency observations. That is, more than 70 percent of the T resources have been identified. And as you can see, later, here, uh, it is also later, and uh, another radio galaxy, the far one galaxy, appears here. Then turns out with the 37 colors of the nebula, then the six pulsars, six pulsars, well, it depends on <laughs> how you count it. <laughs> but anyway, the six pulsars have been found, and the eleven supernova nebula um, have found so far. Then they are, uh, they are raised in the table of TEV catalog. I was wondering if uh, some of these uh, pulsars are actually megatons. Uh, megatons. Uh, like megatons in, in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, some of them. Some of them. Uh, not rotation, not rotational power. So rotational power, rotational pulsars, uh, only three of them are included here. And, well, I don't, I don't want to go into the details, but, well, Geminga is not still established. So essentially only Krab and Vila uh, have been found in the TV sky. Then ISETS highlights. Uh, let me uh, well pick up the uh, the highlights of uh, imaging atmospheric Cherenkov telescope observations. Uh, which are limited to black hole related issues only. The most important things are the two findings from um, non blazer radio galaxy M87 and another non blazer galaxy, uh, non blazer radio galaxy IC310. Because for blazers, for blazers, jets are pointing toward us. So it's not easy to see directly the central region. We, we, well, the central uh, emission from the central region are uh, overpowered by the jet emission. However, for non blazers jets are pointing away from our light of sight, then we can directly observe the central regions. <coughs> and we have detected uh, a rapid variability for M87, whose um, central magnetic, uh, whose central black hole is measured to be about uh, six billion solar masses. Then from the variation time scale, we can find that the emission region should be low, should, emission region should have the size that is comparable to the light crossing time of the event horizon. And from another radio galaxy, IC310, we have detected, well, it was, it was found by magic. Uh, and five minutes um, rapid variation has been found, which is even um, shorter than the light crossing time of the event horizon. So the uh, size of the emitting um, region should be small compared to the event horizon size. So um, we are motivated to consider the emissions from the very vicinity from the direct vicinity of uh, rapidly revolving black holes of these two radio galaxies and others. So this is the end of chapter one. Uh, do you have any questions about chapter one? Uh, please. Two 
what is what is refinery and what is important. So those costs are not in the refinery. Well, we need to take an advantage of our new binary. Because they are spun up by accretion during the most uh, extra binary phase. So, mm, well, except for the music and the pulsars, young pulsars are found not in binaries. However, music and the pulsars are, on the other hand, found in binaries. So, binary pulsars are also in the sense included. But not aggression towards well, In some cases, for, uh, for a few examples, for, uh, for a few exceptions of music and pulsars, they are aggregating powered and rotation powered, they are switching. But well, most pulsars are rotation powered, except for magnetars. Magnetars are magnetic field. Magnetars emission comes from the magnetic energy. However, um, well, for most of the pulsars, eaglet, or eaglet or pyramidal pulsars, they are rotationally powered. Describes the electron <coughs> in the electron rest frame. 
So electron will operate in, if exposed by an external electric field supplied by the insect photons. For a polarized radiation field, the differential cross-section becomes well, the differential cross-section for the total scattering becomes like this. Here, theta comes in um, as cosine square theta. So it, it has a symmetry for forward and backward directions. And R naught refers to the classical electron radius. If you equate electron waste mass and mc square with the electronic potential R and E squared divided by R, you can obtain in the classical electron radius. And classical electron radius squared essentially becomes the classical uh, Thomson cross section. Except, except for a detailed factor. And the total cross section becomes a Thomson cross section. You have to integrate the differential cross section over solid angles, then you finally obtain this Thomson cross section. Here, this is an additional factor. But essentially, in classical electron radius squared is the Thomson cross section. This is a total cross section. And we should notice here that the scattering can occur if the incident photon is uh, scattering can also occur if the incident photon is a virtual photon. If the incident photon energy becomes comparable or greater than the electron rest mass energy in the electron rest frame, then quantum effect appears in two ways. First, in the recoil of the electron, and second, in the reduction of the cross section. And this is the quantum electrodynamic effect. Then, consider the, the scattering of a photon of an electron in the electron rest frame. Then, we find that the, you know, uh, the final photon has the energy represented by this. It comes from the energy and momentum conservation. And the quantum electrodynamics gives a differential cross section for unpolarized radiation, and it is called the Klein-Nishina cross section. This is an exception for the unpolarized radiation. You have to uh, average the two states of polarization, x plane and x plane, for instance, then you obtain the unpolarized uh, photon. Uh, or a differential cross-section for unpolarized uh, radiation field. Here, classical terms of cross-section appears, and another relativistic correction appears. Integrating um, the Klein-Nishina differential cross-section over the solid angle, we obtain the total cross-section. So the total cross-section is proportional, well, becomes of the order of total cross-section times correction factors like this. And um, if the instant photon energy, how do you divide it by mc squared, or h nu describes the instant photon energy, then um, if the instant photon energy is much smaller compared to the electron rest mass energy in the electron rest frame, then the cross-section essentially becomes a total cross-section. Then as the instant photon energy increases, the cross-section reduces by relativistic effect, uh, the quantum effect. Now let us consider in the observer's frame, then we have to apply the uh, Lorentz transformation twice once for the instant photon, and second to the final photon. Then for the instant photons, asterisks 
here denotes um, the qualities in the electron rest frame. And known, as, known asterisk refers to the observer's frame qualities. Then we apply the Lorentz transformation from the uh, observer's frame to the electron rest frame. Then again from the electron rest frame to the observer's frame for the final photons. We find that the ratio of the instant photon energy and the final photon energy becomes 1 versus gamma squared. So we find that the phot instant photon will be will get energy by the factor of gamma squared by the inverse control scatterings. For instance, if the instant photon is 100 electron volt soft X-ray, and if the electron volt factor is 10 to the third, then we multiply gamma square that 1 million to the photon energy, and we find that the final photon energy will be 100 MeV. Approximately. Well, the detailed factor depends on the angle into which the final photon will be scattered. But on the order of magnitude, we, we have to multiply gamma squared to the initial photon energy, as long as the instant photon energy is small compared to the electron mass mm -hmm. energy in the electron rest frame. Well, of course, uh, well, if the instant photon energy becomes comparable by even greater than the electron energy, then uh, the recoil becomes important. And finally, uh, the photon energy cannot exceed the electron energy by energy conservation. For isotropic distribution of photons, an electron emits the inverse Compton radiations at this rate. Well, the factor for third is a bit, uh, a bit too detailed, but essentially it is given by the product of uh, tonga cross section times, the speed of light times, gamma square times, and the density of instant uh, soft photon field. Here, Velocity C times energy density gives the energy flux. And gamma square is the amplification factor. So uh, you multiply the energy flux, velocity times density, and you multiply the energy flux with uh, the cross section. And you also have, you also have to multiply the amplification amplification factor, then you finally obtain the inverse Compton scattering, and inverse Compton power. And the factor for full slot comes from the angular average of this factor, which comes from the Zoran transformation. So we learned uh, that the uh, inverse Compton scattering amplifies the soft photons by the factor gamma squared, the gamma is a Lorentz factor. You know, the Lorentz factor. What is the Lorentz factor? I, I forgot to explain the why. Sorry. I assume we have learned special relativity. But what, what is the Lorentz factor? Oh, sorry. That particle velocity is yes. defined by the particle velocity, yes. Sorry, I forgot to explain. V is a particle velocity, see, speed of light. So you. So you define the Lorentz factor by you know, 1 over square root of 1 minus beta. Beta is a dimensionless particle velocity. So if 
particle velocity is zero, Lorentz factor is one. And if particle velocity approaches C, um, Lorentz factor becomes much, much greater than unity. It's always greater than unity. Have you learned special relativity? Please raise your hand, student. No, nobody? <laughs> oh, really? Happy, happy. Come on, that's freshman physics. <laughs> <laughs> Repeat your question again. <laughs> I mean, that's getting boring. <laughs> Have you learned special relativity somewhere so far? Oh, please raise your hand. Above <laughs> your head, okay, man? <laughs> uh, okay, okay, thank you very much. A certain function of you have to learn special relativity. Ah, that uh, 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 kind of prerequisite. No, they have all that special relativity. Oh, okay, okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry. Okay. Move on. Okay. Maybe they forget, but anyway, they have run. <laughs> <laughs> At least, please do understand that the last factor, it appears frequently later. Lorentz factor becomes one when the particle is at rest, and Lorentz factor becomes much greater than unity when the particle motion is relativistic. Yes. Okay. Actually, I don't wonder if all these uh, particles are not Then we should also consider the beam effect. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, putting a beam effect to bring the time for the flux movement. Well, it's a total, total power. So, it is angle integrated. Oh. Yes. But, uh, have you ever, have, do you understand beaming? Really explain what is a realistic beaming, beaming effect. Have you done aberration of light propagation direction? Aberration. I think you write it in Chinese this way. <laughs> And the max 
für die Kirchen gibt, das so gut wie ein Viecher Potential für das Scale Potential, hier in der Grid Function Technik, und uh, Potential is given by the integration of the Delta function divided by R times rho refers to the charge density at R prime and P prime. You have to integrate the mm, effect of mm, charge on the Kozaki cone. Then you can represent it by Q divided by kappa R. R. Uh, I did right here. R, R is here, yes. R at time T prime, T prime is point. And R is a uh, uh, position. We measure the electromagnetic field. And R naught is a particle path. Sorry, sorry, I, I, I'm a little bit uh, uh, confused. Uh, so, so the, the, the red dot is and the green dot, what, what, what are they? Uh, uh, red, red dot? Uh, red dot refers to the um, position at which we measure the electromagnetic field. So that's where we, we are? Yes, yes. We, yes. we put okay. instrument here. Oh, okay. Uh, and, for, and, and the two blue dots are... are two blue dots are the cross-section of the uh, world line of the particle with the light cone or causality cone. It has 45 degrees gradient. It's a cone. It's about two dots. Well, well two dots. Okay. It, it doesn't have to be two, three, or four, or one. It does. This yeah. is the past of something? Yes, we sum up um, the effect of um, the information of particle charges, particle. charges okay. in the past, and it affects well, the electromagnetic, the electromagnetic wave propagates at the speed of light. So the past information of the particle position and charge affects the future. Electromagnetic field. And what, what, uh, and what, um, what is the cone? A cone. Mm. Well, okay. Well, yes, it's a light cone. If you emit, if you emit light, if you emit light homogeneously, then. The photon will propagate with 45 degrees of the angle cone. We call it the light cone. The light cone. Light cone. And it's a, it's a reverse of the light cone. So it describes um, the space time position that can affect the electromagnetic field at position R and time P. Uh, and have, you, have you done special reflecting? Maybe, but I... I <laughs> 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 but I feel sorry for my teacher. <laughs> no, you are not in my group. <laughs> So that's the reason why I'm not in your group. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so the, the, the angle at that can will be 45 degrees, for sure. Mm, because light propagates as a light. So, for example, one measurement, one if getting around the x direction, 
And if we de define the wire wire access to be pseudo flat C times times T, then right properties with So and x equals so the propagation direction is given by speed of light times duration time t. Therefore, the broad line of the photon becomes forms 45 degrees with respect to the uh, spatial axis. You just chose C equal to 1, so it's equal to T. That is the only that you know, I think they will get the idea. even more confusing to them. I'm not done, but this is, I'm saying that maybe 45 degrees will be confusing, but if you say C equal to 1, then it is no longer confusing. Yes, in later chapters, I will mean use C equal to 1. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, maybe a bit complicated. <laughs> we, should, we can uh, write one textbook. They write the full details of the derivative potentials and the non video potential. And the and we have a similar expression that it is given by Q charge Q times velocity U divided by C times same factor kappa times uh, the relative position vector R uh, evaluated at a retarded time. Then for the uh, photon uh, photon uh, photon uh, from the potential we have we have to uh, temporary we have to take a temporal derivative of phi and special uh, um, sorry temporal derivative a and special derivative derivative of phi to obtain the electro electric field. You know how to calculate electric field from scalar and vector potential. For instance, if stationary then, uh, do you know how to calculate electric field from the scalar and vector potential? Scalar, yeah. Can you explain how they calculate the electric field from the vector potential and the scalar potential? And please explain how to calculate electric field, the electric field. But all the magnetic field can be computed by rotation A. Then how about the electric field? Yes, how can you calculate the electric field from the scalar potential and vector potential? Temporal density of the vector potential minus spatial derivative of the scalar potential, uh, temporal derivative of the vector potential minus temporal derivative of the you know, uh, sorry, spatial derivative of the scalar potential. Have you learned the relationship between the vector scalar potential and the electromagnetic field? Have you learned that? You haven't learned that. I did. They did. Pretty sure if they are from physics department. They are from physics department. No? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, from the house, we can calculate the electromagnetic field. Then the, the electric field uh, is composed of two terms. One is called uh, the velocity field, which is proportional to the particle velocity uh, beta. 
And another one is the uh, acceleration field, which is proportional to the acceleration of the particle velocity, beta dot. Beta is V over C, dimensionless particle velocity. And the magnetic field can be computed by the, taking uh, N is a uh, unit vector towards the line of sight. Then you find there are two terms. And we should notice here that the velocity field is proportional to 1 over r squared, while the acceleration field is proportional to 1 over r. Therefore, if we take the ratio between the radiation field and the velocity field, we find that the ratio becomes beta times the distance from the particle to the observer divided by uh, lambda. Lambda is uh, defined to be uh, V over C, and uh, sorry, nu. Nu is the frequency um, of the uh, electric field variation divided by C is a uh, wavelength uh, of the uh, 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 electric field uh, uh, wavelength of the radiation. So we find that the relative field dominates only in the near zone, which is less than the uh, wavelength, while the acceleration field dominates in the far zone. So the velocity field does not carry energy to large distances, while the radiation field can carry the energy to infinity. And the pointing vector is given by e equals p. Usually, we use the acceleration electric field to compute the emission spectrum and so on by fully analyzing the time-dependent electric field, then you square it, then you look at the spectrum. However, we can drive the same results by using the velocity field by introducing the virtual contour. For example, the singleton radiation can be interpreted as the inverse contour scattering of virtual photons in an external magnetic field. We thus consider such explanation in these lectures, because uh, the method using the acceleration electric field is described in many textbooks, such as Wiebeck and Lightman's textbook. So I give. Um, I explained.
פחות קצת. The implication, physical implication. No. And the ratio, the ratio. Oh, this one. Oh, okay. So the radiation field carry energy and momentum to large distances, to infinity. Because it has only one of our arms. Then if you compute the quantum effects, then you find that the quantum effect depends on one of our arms square. Okay, magnetic field is given by n cross b n of the unit vector. So that's, but n cross e gives a magnetic field in vacuum. Then you can calculate the pointing flux by multiplying e cross b. So you find that the acceleration field has r dependence one over r squared if you compute the pointing flux. Do you agree? Okay, then if you multiply the entire area, 4 by r squared, then you find that the integrated energy and momentum is constant for r. Yeah, I mean, I still agree about all the equations, but what I don't understand is that the physical meaning of that in simple language. Physical line, physical no, meaning, yeah. what? Uh, 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 that uh, this equation? No, no. This? Yeah. Uh, so you can find the R dependence of the ratio between radiation field and velocity field. Yes. I know, but I mean, if that is R dependent, that mm -hmm. is something. Uh, yes, yes. So the radiation field becomes more and more important at um, large distances away from the charge. So, so the radiation field survives and carries energy and, energy, and energy, energy and momentum to large distances. But velocity field cannot carry any energy and momentum to large distances. Velocity field exists only in the very vicinity of the particle while radiation field carries energy momentum. So if there's an acceleration, then um, the pointing flux have no R dependence if you use uh, radiation, uh, acceleration field. So velocity field exists only in the very vicinity of the particle, charged particle. Okay, very good question. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Matters a lot. Yes, yes. So at large distances, radiation uh, acceleration field becomes more and more important. You can think about the velocity field. So velocity field affects the physics only in the intimate vicinity of charged particles. But it is essential in the power environment. So let us consider electron ion blends the strong so-called free free emissions. So electrons and ions, so say protons, have different charge to mass ratio. So they have time dependent uh, dipole moment and uh, dipole moment. For electrons and positrons, they have the equal charge to mass ratios. So in the uh, central uh, center of mass system, uh, the uh, momentum becomes a constant for time. So it has no first order or second order time derivatives. 
Therefore, if you apply the Rama radiation formula, you find that there is no dipole radiation component for electrons and positrons. So for electron positron breath spectrum, and the radiation starts from the quadrupole component, like the gravitational waves, because they have the same uh, charge to mass ratio. However, for electrons and protons, they have different charge to mass ratio, so the radiation starts from the dipole component. And in the electron rest frame, relativistic ion produces a pulse of a velocity electric field in the very vicinity of ions. So in this diagram, electron is here, and ion is moving from uh, ion is moving along the x direction from left to right. R is a relative uh, position vector, A is the unit vector along R. Then, if we plot the time-dependent time-dependent electric field, the x component of the electric field has a small amplitude, which is smaller than the y component by the factor of Lorentz factor. However, the y component has a peaking dependence with respect to t. And the amplitude of the uh, y component of the electric field is given by charge Q times Lorentz of the gamma divided by the impact uh, parameter, B squared. Mm -hmm. So the x direction is the direction of the ion. Uh, direction of the ion motion in the electron rest frame. So that plot implies that in so uh, what really uh, so the uh, uh, energy change is uh, more don't, don't, uh, obvious energy change? in, in uh, which one? I mean uh, that that. Uh, blue one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, blue one. Y component of the so electric field, e electric component around the y axis changes very rapidly. Oh, okay. Well, mm -hmm. first, you, can com you can compute the electric field of the ions in the ion rest frame. So, then Lorentz transform from the ion rest frame to electron rest frame. Then you find that the y component rapidly change as a function of time. So if, if an ion moves in this direction, mm -hmm. so in this direction... In a perpendicular field, direction to the ion motion. Yes, so the field would change a lot, uh, 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 more mm -hmm. than the perpendicular one. Yes, this is the result of the Lorentz transformation. Uh, have you done the Lorentz transformation of the electron magnetic field? Because I I I am not from the physics department. Uh, okay. Okay. Then please read Rebecca Reichmann's textbook. Yeah, but I what 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 I'm curious about is about is physical meaning. Physical meaning. Yeah, because if uh, that means an iron move in this direction, mm -hmm. what it really uh in fact more is the field lines. In, in, in vertical direction. Ah, okay. Is well, electromagnetic field does not change on the particle motion, but changes, well, V cross B appeared. Um, gamma times V cross B appears in the perpendicular directions. So... Can we observe this kind of phenomenon? Yeah, of course, yes. In nature? Yes. For example? For example, well, for example, in that case, if you, <laughs> if you put a uh, well, apparatus here and measure the electromagnetic field, then if you move some charged particle along the x-axis, then you will find a spiky profile of the electric field into the perpendicular direction. Like that. It's a, it comes from the Lorentz transformation. Lorentz factor gamma is multiplied. Gamma times 
что вы их распили. Опять я вы, вы их съели. Вы у вас есть звонки. Окей. Окей, не Because of this past velocity electric field, electron oscillates to radiate by the dipole formula. That is, a vector photon, velocity field photon, is upscattered to become a real photon. So the electron oscillates in the electric field, in, in this blue electric field, then it oscillates radiation by the Raman formula, which starts from the dipole component. Then the vector photon that appears only in the very vicinity of the charged particle is upscattered to become a real photon and propagate to infinity. And this phenomenon is called relativistic Reynolds Strahl. So the nature of the virtual photons are the velocity velocity field of the electric field. The same idea can be applied when a charge is moving in an external magnetic field. Then we can compute the synchrotron radiation for each charge. So do we have any do we have any questions so far? Now only one point I want to point out that this relative velocity that you said that relative velocity is typically Maxwell Boltzmann, typically in a real gas, that's he was asking in a real situation. So this relative velocity is coming from Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, mm -hmm. mean velocity, mm -hmm. and therefore it is square root of temperature, mm -hmm. and therefore your this Bremsstrahlung will typically have this square root of temperature behavior because it depends on the relative velocity between the electron and the proton. Mm -hmm. And in a real gas, since proton has a low, less mobility mm -hmm. than the electrons, mm -hmm. so you can think that they are really having this uh, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, the electron, mm -hmm. and so the velocity will be square root of, proportional to square root of temperature. Yes, so yes. this effect is typically mm -hmm. what we, is written also in Levy like mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you see that it will go like 3 to the power. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's not, instead of a random velocity, mm -hmm. we know that it is a coming from Maxwell Boltzmann. Mm -hmm. right? Yes, we con well, for convenience we computed this phenomena in the electron rest frame, mm -hmm. but we have to convert it to the laboratory frame. But the radiation part is the same. Yeah. Yeah. These are good, but it is a rolling invariant, so it is the same. Okay, now let us move on to the third chapter, synchrotron radiation. If an electron is moving in a magnetic field, a time-varying velocity field arises in the electron rest frame. Uh, it comes from the Lorentz transformation. There is, if there is an external magnetic field, then if particle is moving around the magnetic field, then the, in the rest frame of the particle, the particle feels uh, electric field perpendicular to the magnetic field. This is a velocity field. Vital photon has an energy which is given by h cross omega cyclotron. Cyclotron frequency um, times h cross times sine alpha. Alpha is a pitch angle um, of the particle. Thus, the upscattered photon the upscattered photons will have the energy which is amplified by gamma square factor to the vector energy. In this case, the photon is provided by an external, external magnetic field and it is upscattered um, by the relativistic motion of the uh, electron. A uh, 
bitter arguments. Additional factor of three half arises that the synchrotron characteristic energy becomes synchrotron characteristic energy becomes three half times gamma square times synchrotron energy times the sine of the pitch angle. Then you find that it is given by uh, gamma cubed divided by the gyro radius. Gyro radius in a relativistic regime becomes and the, the particle energy divided by QB. Since the cyclotron photon energy is 11.57 kV for the magnetic field strength of 10 to the 10 scars, and the cyclotron photons have a typical energy of uh, 17 kV for uh, 17 kV times gamma squared for the magnetic field strength of 10 to the 12 scales. So the synchrotron, the synchrotron photon energy is proportional to gamma squared. This is because uh, the synchrotron process is an inverse contact scattering of universal photon with synchrotron frequency. So gamma square factor appears. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very good question. So the electric field has a very sharp peak because well, in synchrotron process, um, the photon emission angle is very um, well limited in the instantaneous um, direction of the particle motion. So we observe the photons only in a very short fraction of time. Peak, 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 peak. So the electric field forms a very sharp peak. Such sharp peaks can be represented by Fourier analysis by superposing many frequencies. Many frequencies. You cannot fit such a peaking time profile by a simple sine curve. You have to superpose many higher harmonics, and you have to. Um, integrate all the wide frequency ranges to express the time varying electric field. So if you fully analyze such a peaking electric field, you you inevitably obtain a broad spectrum of the radiation. So how 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 do they get that number? Seventy four something. Uh, seventy four something. Well is that wrong? It, it, it up because of all this. Okay. Yeah, it's direct, direct, direct from from this. But you can alternatively compute the photon energy by uh, uncertainty principle. Because delta T times delta E equals, uh, yeah, equals uh, the plan uh, constant H by uncertainty principle. And delta E is H cross omega. So, Cut out H cross, then you obtain delta T times delta omega nearly equals to 1. So, well, Fourier transformation and uncertainty principles describes the same feature of waves, same characteristic of waves. So, in that sense, they are essentially the same. So, you can use the Fourier transformation or a simplified uncertainty principle. Therefore, the a really short time scale, delta T being time scale, can be inversed to keep the frequency of the wave. So it gives a characteristic wave by the answer the difference for or alternatively by fully transformation. Same thing. Very good question. The synchrotron radiation power can be estimated by multiplying Thomson cross section times photon, well, the velocity C times photon number density gives a number of flux times 
、あのサイクルトンエナジーガンマスクエアっていうさ、フォトンエナジーフラックス、アイムスクロスセクション、ギブス、ザ・パワー、エルクス・パー・セカンド、バイ・シンクルトン・レディエーション、which is given by the product of トントン・クロスセクション、タイムス・シー・タイムス、マグネティック・フィールド・エナジー・デンスティス、タイムス・ガンマスクエア。And the magnetic field energy density is given by p squared divided by 8p. Now it, it is alternatively written as the partial photon number density times、um, energy per photon. And for, uh, for an estropic distribution of the pitch and the alpha, a detailed argument shows that the synchrotron power is given by this. Then, Um, we can remind that the inverse quantum power is proportional to the real photon number density in U pH divided by gamma square, blah, blah. And for the synchrotron photons,、um, magnetic field energy times gamma squared times the same factor. So we find that the ratio between the synchrotron power and the inverse quantum power is given the inverse quantum of the real photons, soft photons. Mm, is given by the ratio between the magnetic field energy density and the photon energy densities. Here we assume that the distribution of the pitch angle is isotropic, but even if the pitch angle distribution is、uh, significantly anisotropic, anisotropic then only a slight modification is needed to the factor. So, anyway, The ratio between the synchrotron power and the inverse quantum power is approximately anyway given by the ratio between the magnetic field density and the soft photon energy density in any case.、Um, sorry, so,、uh, the very,、uh, uh, so the very、uh, last、uh, so、equation, one?、Uh, the last one, that can tell us that which That's right. In different kind of environment. That's right. So、uh, we can quickly examine whether synchrotron radiation or inverse control radiation is important by looking at the magnetic field energy density and soft photon energy density. And the transfer momentum is quant quantified、uh, with discrete energy values called the ladder levels. And the ground, ground state has a zero point energy in quantum mechanics. And after falling onto the ground state, an electron can, an electron can, no, can no, no longer emit. The longitudinal motion is not quantified,、uh, which allows continuous distribution of the parallel momentum. Perpendicular momentum is quantified, but parallel momentum is not quantified. So after particles fall, fall onto the ground state, ground bundle state, only the longitudinal momentum contribute to the emission. So, if a macroscopic particle motion follows a curved trajectory with curvature radius RC, and the particle emits the pure curvature radiation with the characteristic energy which is given by gamma cubed divided by the macroscopic curvature radius. And we can remind that the synchrotron、um, photon and Synchrotron photons have the characteristic energy given by gamma squared, no, gamma cubed, divided by the gyro radius. Then, if we compare these two expressions, we find that if we simply replace the gyro radius with the macroscopic curvature radius of the magnetic field, we can readily obtain. The photon energy and emission power of the curvature process. So, in another word, curvature radiation is a kind of the synchrotron process when we replace the general radius with the macroscopic curvature radius.
Is that a reason? Yeah. We can also calculate the intermediate case in which uh, the perpendicular momentum uh, has not uh, fall onto the ground state, ground ground state, but it's a bit complicated, so we skip this argument. So called the single capture radiation, we skip it. Then finally, let us briefly mention about the electron position pair production. On the collide with angles um, theta c, then electron position pair may be produced. And the total cross section for this um, photon photon collision becomes like this. Here, V is defined to be the square root of um, this function, and we find that the photon photon production takes place only when the threshold is satisfied. That is, the product of the two initial photons should be greater than the electron rest mass energy squared times relative velocity factor appears here. So if two photons collide head on each other, it's very difficult to uh, materialize as pairs. However, if two photons head on collide, not tail on, but head on collide, then theta becomes zero, which means this factor becomes unity. So the threshold becomes the most easiest to be satisfied for head on collisions. So photon photon pair production most easily take place when the two photons collide almost head on. Uh, so the cross section becomes much greater if a uh, photon collide with nuclear. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm. With atoms, right? Mm. Yes. So, any questions for chapters one and two? We can just finish. Okay, thank you very much. Break and come back at two. Okay. Yeah.